morning, everybody. This is Steve Alke Napier. Welcome to the Circle of Brilliance. Today, we're going to continue our discussion about laughter and see where it fits on the change grid, how that uh, might change based on where on the change grid you land. Um, and ultimately, we'd like to get to how individuals can use laughter as a tool for changing their mindset, changing their uh, thoughts, attitudes, beliefs, behavior, uh, all that good sort of stuff that comes along with it. And uh, what triggered this call was we were noticing more and more um, opportunities for people to take classes about laughter therapy or i even saw laughter yoga there was even a laughter meditation which made me laugh because i thought everybody laughing would kind of disrupt my meditation <laughs> so uh, i thought okay well, this could be something that's really uh, worth exploring on Tuesday, we started going through these nine triggers uh, that uh, um, uh, people who are creating comedy would use in order to um, see what's going on in terms of, uh, you know, joke construction, making people uh, laugh and, and, and all that came along with that. So um, I've got a couple more people I need to unmute here real quick. Let me unmute. Hey, Edie. Hey there, David. Hi there. Hi there. Okay, so uh, we talked about surprise and superiority, which is the one that continues to be the one I think is uh, really very interesting to uh, do a deeper dive into that a lot of times um, the laughter that someone might uh, display is an expression of a judgment they have made about the person or situation they are laughing at. And so it's almost a way of critically uh, analyzing and, and that. And so we talked a little bit about where on the change grid did that live? And uh, for those of you who weren't on that call, we decided that lives out grid. That kind of starts to tip its toe into a bullying sort of a behavior. Um, we talked about surprise being kind of an up grid sort of a response and embarrassment being a bit of an in grid origin for someone laughing, et cetera. Release would be a down grid maneuver. Um, incongruity, I think, is where we uh, left off last time around. And it's when two things that seem like they don't go together um, are kind of made to go together. And we'll forever, we, we find it very humorous. And this is where the turn of a clever word or whatever might do that. And um, those of you who weren't on the call last time around, I had a little meme up and it's a meme of a rabbit who's sitting at a bar drinking a beer and the little copy at the bottom says a priest, a rabbit and a minister walk into a bar and the rabbit says I think I'm a typo. And uh, so let that sink in for a second those of you who weren't on it you can find it. Uh -huh. Thank you so much, David. I appreciate that. Yeah. So it's two very dissimilar ideas comes together and people find incongruity can often trigger laughter. So that leaves these four last ones we want to talk a little bit about. And so recognition. Laughter is expected when one recognizes or relates to an event mentioned by the comedian. Here the comedian highlights a basic event which most can relate to and makes a joke about it. So any kind of like a shared life experience and looking back on it, we found that to be humorous or whatever the, uh, the, the case might, might be. So um, I'll give you one example of that. Uh, when Linda and I had decided that we were going to be moving internationally and we started going through all of our things, deciding what we wanted to keep and what it was time to get rid of, my uh, high school yearbooks came into discussion. And it's interesting when you start looking back at photos in a high school yearbook, how you start laughing at what the hairstyles were, the way people were dressing or whatever the case may be. And then it's just kind of like this recognition sort of a thing. You look back on it, and at the time, it all seemed perfectly normal. But looking back on it now, the times have changed and, uh, you know, everyone's matured and all that. You look back on these things and it brings up a little bit of a, of a chuckle. Can you all relate to that? Yes. Yeah, there's a bunch around the call. All right. So the question is, where does that put you on the change grid? So where were you on the change grid as you have one of these recognitions of something from your past that you can very much relate to 
and look back on it and find something humorous about it. Would that be an upgrid laughter response, an outgrid laughter response, an ingrid, a downgrid, or a somewhere else on the grid response? Where would you guess? I kind of want to think it's downgrid. It's a little downgrid. Yeah. Any place specific downgrid you're thinking about or tell us a little bit about downgrid well, as a choice. Maybe inside the green circle. Mm -hmm. uh, first first uh, uh, um, area there. Yep, yep, um, yep. You know, I, I think that, you know, you relate to an old picture, it brings back old memories. And that's that's a known quantity. So it's kind of a downgrid experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. And of course, the kind of laugh that we would encounter there is hardly uh, going to be one of these deep belly laughs where you end up crying and all that. This is probably like a little chuckle sort of a thing, even it's more of a downgrade expression. Of well, you haven't seen my high school picture, T. Well, we'd love to. Feel free. To, I'll give you screen control if you want to share. It's a belly laugh. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, good to know. <laughs> good to know. All right, other thoughts about... Um, recognition wait no i'm sorry it wasn't called recognition yeah recognition as a trigger for laughter mm, nope all right let's look at the next one then ambivalence being less bothered about something which you should be clearly passionate about is another laughter trigger ambivalence usually comes with the element of surprise which makes it twice as funny now that one i don't really have a great example for to share, but I can certainly say that you're in the midst of life. Something happens that on the surface, you really don't have any real interest in whatsoever. And suddenly you realize you should. Is that the meaning we're pulling from all that? Something surprised us and we go like, oh, I guess I should be concerned about that. Hmm. Well, hey, you, team, must have it, been, you must have been in grid to begin with because you're, uh, you're surprising someone. All right, there you go. That could be all right. So the surprise moved us up grid. And then that feelings of ambivalence about it now is corrective and we're going to laugh at ourselves a little bit. Tim, what did you want to add to that? Well, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, my DNI work uh, and when we are doing educational sessions and if someone shares a, an experience that was not a good experience and the room gets tense, um, Sometimes you get folks making a joke, if you will, or saying something uh, to try and bring some laughter because you can sense uh, the discomfort with the atmosphere mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and, and it distracts from the essence of the story. That okay. Sharing. And so you have to manage that and make sure that folks stay uh, in the moment. Excellent. Excellent. Um someone just chatted one over to me let me read this to see if i can get it oh 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 oh. okay so they're talking about zoom calls and um you're on a zoom call and you haven't put your pants on because you think oh, i'm just on a zoom call no one's going to really notice that i'm not wearing my pants or that there's something in the background that you really weren't paying attention to and so you're kind of ambivalent about what you're wearing ambivalent about whatever is visible on the screen behind you and then suddenly someone brings it to your attention it surprises you and you kind of laugh it off a little bit so now does that sound to you guys like a kind of variation on nervous laughter the laughter that might come from a little bit of embarrassment up here. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit of that. I mean, it's a good thing you're wearing your, you know, you might not be fully dressed, but at least you're wearing something. <laughs> so there are so like so I think that's really it's kind of like on the one end you really didn't care. And suddenly you find yourself surprised by something that makes you care. Um okay, yes. Um Carmen is sharing, think maybe laughter is used to hide discomfort. All right, that's a great insight. And so uh, sometimes the reason why the person is laughing is because they're uncomfortable now in that situation and um, feeling a little bit embarrassed might be too strong of a word, but just a little bit uh, caught. 
off um, off off guard or off your game. Again, you guys are all welcome to, un to unmute again. This is the circle of brilliance. This is really all about all of us hearing from everyone, whatever their thoughts are. It's not, this isn't like the oracle of the self where I'm just talking to individuals about individual applications and how all of these techniques and, and insights are applying to their personal lives and all that. This is about getting together um, a group of what I consider the brightest and the best people who can take what we know about the basics of tension management and the change grid and hopefully expand upon that and flesh it out and get it to apply in new and interesting sorts of ways. So no, and no one ever hesitate to unmute and just share whatever it is you'd like to share with whatever's going on. So uh, yeah, so anyway, ambivalence, I think that's interesting. Let's take a look at configurational. This trigger, um, it, oh, by the way, going back to what David was saying, probably is more of an in-grid kind of a thing that then moves you up grid all of a sudden and you're kind of chuckling your way back down grid, trying to normalize uh, for yourself what's really going on because we've all been there, it's all happened, whatever. All right, uh, so now let's take a look at this next one, configurational. This trigger is one that could be more like a riddle. Here the comedian says a joke which may need the audience to think about or figure out the punchline for themselves. It's funny when they get it. Um, personally, I think that's the funniest stuff where you have to like give people just say, wait a second, it'll come to you. <laughs> just think about it. <laughs> <laughs> and then suddenly, suddenly they all they all start laughing. And I'll give you uh, an example of this. Uh, Linda and I were on a cruise, and um, this cruise decided to have a contest. And the contest was all about being able to tell a blonde joke. The deal was that only blondes could tell a blonde joke. So they were just going like, this is all one of those things. And by the way, this is many years ago where such behavior would not have been considered uh, a big step out of whatever is socially acceptable today. So uh, let's, let's not try to judge a behavior of years and years ago by today's standards, but nevertheless, a blonde joke and only blondes could tell them. And so uh, the joke was this. What did the blonde say when the doctor told her she was pregnant? And the answer was, is it mine? And so it was interesting how there was silence, like right now none of you are laughing. So, you know, are you sure it's mine? <laughs> so it's a very strange kind of a thing. So you had to wait for people to kind of go like, oh, no, I get it. And then they would laugh. So I think that's the kind of thing that we're really talking about for configurational um, laughter. Are you guys have anything you want to add about that? Thoughts about that? Do I need to explain the joke? No. Suddenly they're all quiet. Unmute yourself. Say something. All right. So um, now here's the thing about, about that. Again, I was looking for the kinds of situations that trigger laughter. And it just so happened that I stumbled across this page that was trying to provide education to comics on how to craft more effective jokes. And, um, and I thought like, well, enough of this applies to daily life that I thought we could get some real good meaning out of it. Well, this configurational one to me seems to be the one that requires the greatest amount of preparation, the greatest amount of construction, deliberate thinking, et cetera, in order for you to be able to pull that one off. So when I looked at the change grid, I kind of went like, well, if I wanted to craft such a joke, where do you think I should be on the change grid to craft such a joke? Where do you think the best comedy writing would live on the change grid. Outgrid. Okay, outgrid, and any more specific location for outgrid? Um, well, not certainly not in the danger zone, but I would say probably uh, uh, just outside of that inner circle. Yeah, okay. And so what we're looking at then is either um, an analytical driver energy, perhaps an expressive driver energy, um, the little amiable, it's kind of like we're kind of outside of that now, but we don't want to be this far out grid. And so when I think about constructing anything, I immediately think, oh, well, there's some kind of analytical energy that's in play there because you had to figure something out. How can I make this clever? How can I um, give people enough information that they should be able to figure it out? 
um, yet uh, hold back enough that there is this feeling of of accomplishment when they actually do figure the joke out. So yeah, I get it, I get it, I get it. So I'm thinking probably more of an analytical driver energy is where that would come from. Uh, Carmen is sharing kind of when you figure it out, kind of a laugh to oneself. It's like, you know, laugh, like a little celebration. Good for me, I figured it out. It is funny. <laughs> That's clever. That's clever. That's clever. Um, very often, these kinds of jokes are the uh, careful presentation of a truth. And so one thing I've always said about, about joking around is that at the heart of every joke is a seed of truth. And oftentimes, particularly in business settings, people tend to repackage information in the form of a joke because they think it's going to be more readily accepted by the individual without triggering offense. And so, you know, I'm just joking, whatever, whatever people might say, but you know, at the heart of that joke is a seed of truth. They were just trying to package it carefully so that it didn't trigger uh, any kind of a negative response to it. Well, I think that requires a certain level of analytical energy to be able to pull that off effectively. Um, and so that's that, that's also part of part of whatever that is, the careful packaging of whatever the message is. Um, can you guys think about uh, that? Uh, so Brian, you've unmuted thoughts about that. Okay. <laughs> You're unmuted. Feel free to chime in if you got there. Okay. Um, Shall I move on to coincidence? Coincidence is usually utilized alongside incongruity. That, that sentence alone gave us work to do. Coincidence is usually utilized alongside incongruity. Okay, so two or more dissimilar ideas. You're making things that do not seem related to seem like a coincidence. Using these triggers on your written jokes will help you identify. You know, wouldn't it have been nice if whoever wrote this document gave a specific example of a joke for these stand-up comics who are trying to figure out how to use that? Because offhand, I don't really know of an example I can give you for a coincidence, but I would say the mechanism of it is probably very similar. You have to become suddenly aware of some sort of a connection that you were not previously aware of, which would have moved you up grid. And then as you sort your way through whatever that incongruity or coincidence may be, your understanding it, your ability, knowledge, skill, experience is increasing. It moves you back down grid and perhaps a bit out grid as you're working through that. Okay, so those are the nine triggers. And I wanted to go through them just so I could say to all of you that not all laughter is identical. Laughter has many different things that can trigger it. And whenever you are uh, looking at um, any kind of a laughter behavior, whether it's your own, because I did give you guys some homework we'll talk about in a minute, recognize that laughter is involved in a in a communication, in some sort of an interaction between two or more people. And so that means that someone who is the creator of the trigger is somewhere on the change grid and they have their reason, their purpose, and the person who responds to it is also somewhere on the change grid. And as a result, movement on the change grid is going to occur. So. So again, not all laughter is created identically. It all it doesn't have the, the same movement or the same motives, et cetera. So going back to this idea about laughter as being, what did they call it over here? Laughter as superiority. This idea about an outgrid person may be looking down on you or down on a population. And they have a tendency to make jokes about you or about that population. And at an extreme, it can become a bullying sort of behavior. So what they're trying to do is to not only um, target your insecurities, but somehow enhance your, uh, your insecurities or the impact of those insecurities. So how many of you have ever felt like someone is making fun of you? Um, in that case, 
you have four different ways available to you to respond to someone making fun of you. Who wants to unmute and tell me any of the different ways one might be uh, making fun of someone else? Anybody? Say it again, T. Yeah, the question is, have, has anyone ever made fun of you? How did you respond to that? And there are four different ways that you could have responded. So can you flesh it out and tell me, well, I responded this way. I also could have responded this way, this way, this way. So what do you think? Well, I think, I think if, you, if, you're, if you're caught off guard, you're going to have some nervous laughter uh, as a response. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that if you understand what's being said, and and don't agree with it, uh, um, you know. You, you're obviously going to have a different response. I, I am. I'm not sure. I can think of four different responses that you could make, but. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let me. Yeah. Go ahead. You know what, T? Yeah, I'm. I'm thinking one could be outgrid, one could be ingrid, down. I think it could be all four. Mm -hmm. yeah. One would be where you get defensive. And then one is where you create an alignment. If people laugh at me, I know I often laugh with them at myself so we actually kind of become more aligned so i can see that all the different responses and one could be where you're just extremely intimidated by it, you know what mm -hmm, i mean and embarrassed mm -hmm. right so i could see them going to all four different parts of ways of it. coping with that attack yeah. Mm -hmm. that has just occurred right and so um what you've described is like getting other people to laugh was a little bit of an upgrade kind of a, a response because upgrade is where all the expressive energy kinds of lives. And so if you can get other people laughing, you're laughing a little bit. Now you've got some support, some camaraderie. You've just, um, <clears throat> you know, a kind of uh, um, swayed it back um, um, away from the attack. And that was good. The Ingrid person might even be further intimidated by it and retreat or burst into tears or whatever the case may be. Um, I'm going to give you a, an example from my own life. Then I want you guys to tell me what kind of response I used. But way back in high school, way back in high school, early days of high school, I fell madly in love with a gal named Vicky. Vicky would not give me the time of day. And so I thought, well, you know, I mean, I get it. I'm, I'm a nerd. I'm, I'm all these kinds of things. I'm a bit of a bookworm. You know, I was one of those kinds of students. And, and so, but I wanted, uh, I like Vicky. I wanted Vicky's attention. And so I found out that Vicky took ballet lessons. And so I enrolled in ballet lessons. And for nine years, I took classical ballet training. And so, um, but early on here I was taking all these little ballet classes and you can imagine what uh, feedback I got from my peers when they found out that I was taking ballet. So Twinkle Toes was the gentlest of the things that they had to say about me. And the moment anyone started attacking me, my response to them was, all I can tell you is that while you are all in locker rooms, snapping each other on the butt with a wet towel and calling it male bonding, I'm in a room with all of your girlfriends. So you tell me who's got the problem. <laughs> and so... <laughs> and, and that kind oh, of intellect, so, an intellectual comeback, huh? Yeah, well, it's just kind of like, look, this is a thing. And I'm the one that's got my hands on their waistlines. I'm the one that's lifting them up. They're all wearing leotard. It's kind of like, again, I'm a high school guy. And so I'm going like, I be, and I'm a nerd. What's the chances of me ever getting that close to, <laughs> to these, you know, great gals? So I just kind of thought like, and they never said another word to me about it. Never said another word to me about it. And if we would go to a dance, any like the school dances, I would go to the school dances. Guess who was on the dance floor for every single dance while all of these gals' boyfriends were standing around the side because they couldn't, they couldn't dance. So uh, whatever. So, so to me, I kind of said, well, bully, you can kind of push something my way and you can cast whatever judgments you want, but I'm going to turn around and judge you even more harshly. 
uh, mm -hmm. for, for that. So to me, that was like an outgrid uh, response to, yep. to that. So to me, and I was laughing, but I was laughing kind of at the bully. So, yeah. Um, now, I don't know what a downgrade response might be, but I'm going to believe they're there. As David said, it's probably more of an intellectual response. What could actually end up being an ignoring response. So, yeah, you find you want to say something to me. I'm just going to shake my head, chuckle and walk away because you're just not worth the energy <laughs> of, uh, you know, trying to explain how it's all working out, how it's all going along. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, other thoughts about, about that. So it's a form of communication. Someone is trying to deliver a message. Someone is receiving that message. Both people are somewhere on the change grid. And uh, that's what we want to kind of be looking at as we work our way around this. So T, where, where is the person on the grid who's, who's directing this your way? Are they up grid? Well, here's the interesting thing. They perceive themselves as having a tremendous amount of ability um, and for whatever reason, I think they felt uh, threatened by me. Otherwise, why would they have singled me out? Somehow or other, they were trying to enhance their own self-image or mitigate their own insecurities. Isn't that kind of like the at the heart of bullying sorts of behaviors? So I think they thought themselves as being um, very capable um, they thought it was a challenging situation, but they didn't represent it as such. They probably presented themselves as being more downgrade. But I know dynamically that's where they were. They were fighting. And if we go back to what we're talking about for survival instincts, that whole fight response comes from someone who's too far outgrid. So if you guys ever find yourselves as an individual in the outgrid danger zone, this is where battle uh, occurs. So upgrid, we tend to flee run away, run away, outgrid, we tend to fight, downgrid, we meet, we tend to um, um, uh, freeze, and ingrid, we tend to fade, to disappear into the background. So right there, so if the behavior is one that's attacking, I think that's why I'm, I'm going to say they're probably outgrid. Okay. Thoughts about that? Yeah, no, I would agree. Oh, yeah, I got Brian needs to be unmuted because he came back in. Yeah, go ahead, Brian, share away. Uh, thank you. I was just going to say, I think that's uh, spot on. I'm thinking about laughter from a neuroscience perspective. And I would think, um, you know, when you reduce norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin, when those mood circuitries, if you will, mood control circuitry of the brain is uh, reduced, it leads to depression. Mm -hmm. So I imagine that laughter, whether it's induced by yourself or it's triggered, helps to really release dopamine because then you have a motivational behavior and a motivational response. Okay, and this is good because I wanted to talk about neurotransmitters next. So let's just, let me ask you to recap something. I'm going to believe that whatever the neurotransmitter activity is, is going to be based on the situation one was in. Right, so, exactly. So, so can you give us an example of a situation that would uh, resonate with what you've just said? So something happened and it moved me where? So think about the, the example that you were describing when you were taking uh, ballet, because I yeah. had to do the same thing for, for football or what you know, in the mm -hmm. United States, you call it soccer, yep. right? Yep. So you want to continue the activity for whatever reason. So you need the motivation to do that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or else you, you would be off track. So in other words, someone can induce a behavior in you and they can trigger you out of what it is, the activity that you're actually doing through mm -hmm. the bullying. Yep. yep. So they're projecting basically their behavior on you. Yep. And think about like the, um, the, the, the stock exchange, right? It says two, you hear the financial experts say two moods uh, um, really control people, mm -hmm. greed and fear mm -hmm. in terms of the stock market. And so literally for some people, that's their mood meter. If the stock market is up, then they're feeling good. Yep, yep. If the stock market is down, then everything is all held for them. Right, right, right. 
Uh, interesting that you bring that up. So just so I can kind of demonstrate for everyone what happens as far as stock market behavior goes, as the um, market is stronger and your positions are strong, you tend to move down grid. And then of course, if you start ignoring what's going on, there could be great change and you won't do anything about it and then you're going to move up grid. But what Brian was just describing is um, this idea about greed and fear. Well, fear lives up grid. So that's one of the hallmark emotions we find in stress. And power stress has as its primary emotion lust the wanting of something. And so greed is certainly a variation on that. Um, so we are either, uh, if we're going to be upgrade, we now view things as a problem that needs to be solved, addressed immediately, where greed is more of an opportunity that we'd like to seize, but we need to strike while the iron is hot and every other metaphor you can think of to, that resonates with that. And so that would indicate heightened levels of dopamine. What else? Yes. Brian? The epinephrine. Yep. Because mm -hmm. it could be triggering a, uh, a, a survival response, particularly if it's uh, has placed them up in distress, the fear. Right, yep. right. And see, the same thing happens with laughter. It's a control mechanism. And they use it. I know of some therapies that they actually use laughter and therapy for people mm -hmm. in certain depressive states. Yeah. So it, it tries to get them to control this frame of mind that they're in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so they use laughter for it. And it becomes a control mechanism to move them to various aspects of control within this frame of mind. And it's situational and it's developmental. Mm -hmm. So it goes mm -hmm. back to what you just described and all those various triggers that uh, could trigger laughter. And so go ahead, Edie, feel free. You, you know what I was just going to say too, um, that we forget that with laughter, apparently because our, our breathing changes, mm -hmm. we were just saying that we cleanse our lymphatic system and so forth because a good hearty laugh, the effect it has on our breathing and the fact that our heavy breathing, um, you know, releases the blocks that we think better, but also it cleans the lymphatic system. I just wanted mm -hmm. to mention mm -hmm. the effect it has on Very that. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. And so, um, so Brian, let's go back a little bit to people that are too far downgrade in power apathy or apathy. So let's say that we've got an individual and for whatever reason, they're feeling some sort of uh, depression, whatever their internal dialogue is, it is how they got there, they got there. So obviously there's a lot to explore and talk about, but nevertheless, they're there. And one of the things that um, I stumbled across as I was doing some preparation for this series of calls is that, and I forget the number, you guys can Google it or maybe you already know, that someone who is considered to be healthy uh, as far as their mental health is concerned, um, has a tendency to laugh outwardly X number of times per day. And I seem to think it was around nine times a day, the, uh, a mentally healthy person seems to laugh. Um, and uh, but as someone becomes increasingly depressed, their instances of laughter become less and less and less. And the quality or the characteristics of their laughter also changes. And they go from perhaps having a true belly laugh back to the slightest chuckle. And maybe even it's not a chuckle, it's a half smile and in your head you think you're laughing but this outward expression of laughter isn't happening. That would resonate with what Edie said because the lymphatic system has no pump of its own. And so right. the only way for it to, to empty itself or for that lymphatic fluid to, to move around is because of muscle movement or massage movements as the case may be. And so we need that deep belly laugh to get things moving. So- exactly. Uh, and that's why I said it's a control mechanism because the, the mood circuitry controls is connected to the body, but you need something to trigger it. So think about people who are down that far down grid, they're inhibiting that. Like they, it's almost like you see someone try to hold in something like hold in their laughter. Mm -hmm. So they desensitize themselves to actually experiencing that experience. I've seen this a lot and people come from like war torn countries 
yeah. and how they're desensitized to a lot of different things because you're experiencing it in your body in some way. Mm-hmm. Whether you whether you laugh outwardly or not, you're experiencing something in your body. But if your circuitry system is desensitized, then it's not going to be the same. And so that's what you're at, literally retraining, if you will, your neuron systems to actually respond to something that's funny. And so what if instead of, of finding something that actually made you laugh, like we all have favorite funny movies and, you know, whatever the case may be, we could all certainly slap something onto Netflix and it may change our state rather quickly. Um, but what could I do it, sort of like, I don't, want, I don't want to give it away. I'm just going to give you this as a seed. What if I just make myself go through the motions of laughter? Forget content, forget context. I'm just making myself um, exhibit the physical aspects of laughter. What could be happening then? So, Brian, that's mostly a question for you. <laughs> yeah, see, again, that when, remember, dopamine can be triggered and released in the anticipation of something. So you don't even have to be necessarily experiencing it. So that's called a dopamine prediction error reward. So what that says is my anticipation of taking myself through the actual motion uh, of it, that you can release the same amount of dopamine as if you actually did experience it. All right. And so, um, again, this goes back to, I think, something that we covered long, long ago when we were talking about neurotransmitters. And that is that the brain, as smart as we all want to think it is, really doesn't know the difference between a state that is real and a state that is vividly imagined. And certain parts of the brain will respond identically regardless. So that's what we're talking about in this case, Brian. Is that right? Yes, because remember the interoception is what the ultimately the nervous system is scanning all these internal processes and is is matching that or trying to mirror that externally what's going on around you and in your environment. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I can't really tell the difference. It's just trying to mirror it. Yeah, yeah. And so it's our help to do it, though. That's the problem. Right. And so I think that's where we're getting back this idea about if we do something deliberately. Now, uh, Carmen has just added a comment here uh, that the body knows if we're being in congruence or so our thoughts in our body. We, we know when we are doing something that is fake laughter at a certain level for a certain period of time. But tell me if I'm if I'm correct and let me know what the neurotransmitter activity is that supports this. But I may start off doing something totally contrived but at a certain point in time which could be a matter of seconds my brain will start to find legitimate reasons to support this contrived feeling into an actual um, legitimate feeling that's exactly it Okay. And so now because I'm so far downgrade I know that there could be some norepinephrine in play but what about serotonin yeah, ser- serotonin uh, will be key there because remember, serotonin always is an inward facing thing. So it's going to bring some sense of normalcy. It'll connect you to a why you're doing what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that, that will help foundationally to get you grounded again. Mm-hmm. 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 So then you can make some definitive decisions as to what, what you can do with this experience that you're currently experiencing. So would you then say that will contrived laughter stimulate serotonin release or production? Yes. Yes. All right. Because again, what I'm trying to get to here is that a lot of us, again, what triggered this whole discussion was me stumbling across and then exploring and finding so many different methods of people managing their own um, physical and mental states through the deliberate um, introduction of laughter as a therapeutic modality. Yes. And so I'm going like, well, if I'm genuinely laughing, I'm genuinely laughing. And they're all saying like, yeah, but if we can just make you fake the laughter um, and you sustain that for a matter of seconds or a matter of minutes, it's amazing how fast it becomes genuine. Yes. 
So that's why I was kind of going like, well, is that that's involving some serotonin that's involving some um, some noradrenaline, some, um, dopamine. some dopamine, some endorphins. Could you tell us what's going on with oxytocin? I know that's a hormone, but. Right, it's a hormone, but oxytocin and serotonin, uh, those, those will be more, they have a hormonal effect, but oxytocin will be more connected to something that you actually bond with and love. So it's not, that's okay. the difference between like a nervous kind of laughter mm -hmm. and a belly laugh. Okay, so if I'm a cat lover and I watch cat videos and they make me smile, they make me laugh, etc., might that also involve some oxytocin? Absolutely, because you can bond with that. And see, that's a okay. bonding kind of hormone uh, effect. All right. And might that get me out of my depression? Yes, absolutely. Right. And that's why they connect me in laughter therapy. They connect people with these things that are central to their environment that they really love because mm -hmm. that, that connection there helps retrain those circuitry systems so that it just becomes kind of commonplace. It becomes normal again, because remember the, the brain's first order of business is to preserve and conserve energy. So it wants to do things minimally. It doesn't necessarily want to work hard to do things. So that training starts with this idea that, wow, okay, yeah, I can get into this, but you, you move from kind of like the, the adult learning model from being this unconscious incompetent to where it's automated you're doing the same thing with laughter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so I guess my question, and this is for, for everybody is, if you are as an individual, or if you are working with an individual, what might you tell them that they can do at an individual level to use laughter as a way to manage uh, their position on the change grid? So. Is there, what might you say if someone is in an upgrade situation, how might they utilize laughter? Uh, if they're in a downgrade situation, how might they use laughter? If they're in an outgrid, forget the bullying extreme, but they're a bit outgrid, focused on getting stuff done, getting stuff done. How might a little bit of self-applied laughter help them as well? Does anyone wanna start throwing out some ideas? Otherwise, I got plenty. <laughs> All right. So um, I'll share with you that I decided to watch a video about laughter yoga uh, because I just thought, like, I just can't picture myself in a yoga class and suddenly I'm starting to laugh. And as I watch this little video about it, people are actually deliberately laughing out. I mean, really out loud and they're looking at one another and they're laughing and, and on and on. And to me, it felt so contrived that I became very uncomfortable even watching the video because my head's kind of going like, well, this is a totally absurd. Well, I kept watching the video for nothing other than scientific research purposes. And by the end of it, these people are all just genuinely having a good old time and laughing. And um, so I thought now, what could I do at the individual level to be able to, to do the same thing? And I thought, well, while I'm doing my yoga position, should I just be laughing? Or is it that I need to be laughing with somebody else or someone else is seeing me as I do that? Um, just kind of curious what you guys think about laughter as a, as a, self, as a tool for self-management. I guess the reason why I'm bringing this up is because if you think it's something that is actually beneficial for individuals to learn how to do, um, then I'd like to throw it into the kind of curriculum for the Oracle of the Self, because obviously that's our program that's all about individual exploration and self-application and all those kinds of things. Thoughts about that? I've always had someone tell me uh, before, uh, to don't take life so seriously. You have to laugh more or laugh at yourself or something like that. Many of my mentors always used to say stuff like that. I don't know if you ever heard that before. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yep, yep, yep. So I always think about it from, from that perspective, like what they were trying to convey to me in terms of you know my up, upbringing where everything had to be a certain way and only that way to experience it and to step out of even that comfort zone. So a lot of times I would just, 
um, literally tried to, I used to try to like just practice laughing and that didn't work. So it's kind of like my body, I think someone just commented on that moments ago, my body would just kind of feel like I'm forcing the issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it will reject it. And that's the problem with like when, when you do fake uh, or when you try to induce laughter with drugs is it tricks the brain into thinking that laughter is, is this, um, is a, a natural response as opposed to just naturally inducing it yourself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You get the same high. So I haven't found really good ways of doing it. I think I'm quite comical and that I often laughed at myself anyway, mm -hmm. but I, it doesn't feel good when I try to force it. Yeah, because building on what Karma was saying, you you feel it's too incongruent. Right. With what you're, yeah. And so let's see, Carmen is saying, can connecting to the heart make you more genuine around doing it? Hmm. That's interesting. Let's, we'll explore that. Um, as we explore that, though, I do want to just get to one other thing that I heard in Brian's thing. I'd love to do it as a question for all of you, but that means you guys have to unmute and actually give me an answer. The person who was suggesting to Brian that he not take life so seriously made that recommendation because they perceived Brian as being where on the change grid. Was Brian too far up grid? too far out grid, too far down grid, too far in grid. What do you guys think? Why would that person suggest that Brian, uh, you know, stop for a moment and not take things so seriously? Good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Anybody? Unmute. Throw out an answer. Type me an answer if you want to. All right. Otherwise, here it goes. <laughs> Brian, what do you think? Were you too far up grid, out grid, down grid, in grid? Where were you on the grid that that individual thought, you know, he needs to chill a little bit? I think I was up grid. Up grid? Uh, yeah. I, yeah, I think up grid because I, I did not, um, because I, I'm, I'm not a person that likes conformity per se. And that sounds strange, you know, being a physician in a regulated field, but I always would push back in some way or find a way to push back. And so teaching everything, you know, it seemed like I was always stressed out. And so I didn't have good control over emotions. And that, that's where the martial arts and things like that came in where I learned how to deal with that. But early on, I did not. So I think I was upgrade probably a lot. Okay, upgrade. Um, okay, that's interesting. All right, fine. Or up, uh, uh, out. Okay, go ahead. Yes. Maybe outgrid or uh, maybe uh, outgrid. All right, David's unmuted. Let's see what David wants to throw in. David, um, you know, I was going to say upgrid before you said outgrid, and when you said outgrid, that that hit me a lot more uh, uh, to to you know hit a lot closer to home. I think somebody who's experiencing that or exhibiting that uh, probably outgrid. Yeah, because I, I didn't I had to learn how to relax because everything is about doing, 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 doing. And I like you need to take life more seriously. Yeah, or more, so. more, you know, more laughter, you know. So everything is about this serious, you know, you couldn't color outside the lines kind of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Strict rules, strict compliance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's what I heard was that you were, they recognize you as being too far out grid where you're pushing the river. So remember we said one cannot push the river, neither can one pull the sprout. Things have to be allowed to unfold in their own natural time frame, their own natural way. But culturally, from what you've described, it's kind of like, no, perfection is what's expected. Just go deliver on uh, it. That's and, exactly it. And that's the way it is. And so someone else is saying like, well, that might be culturally appropriate. That might even be accurate. But sometimes to go faster, you need to slow down, stop and smell the roses, you know, take a little bit of a break, come on, clear your yeah. head. Uh, I think that that's the kind of behavior, uh, behaviors that we might recommend to someone who's too far out grid, burning the midnight oil. Now, if there's a deadline involved, maybe it's a little bit more of an upgrade energy, but it's still this driver 
uh, overall energy that's pushing it. Let me change the background image. Uh, so it's still that driver energy that's really pushing, pushing, pushing for what's going. Someone says like mellow out a little bit, which gets to what mm -hmm. Carmen was saying, connecting to the heart uh, could actually help in that situation. And I think she's absolutely right because if we say, you know, wait a second, let's stop for a moment. And instead of looking towards the goal, let's pause for a moment and look in or let's look behind us and look at the reasons why this is important to us or to others. Let's connect with whatever the situation is at more of that heart level and mm. see how that goes. Like, you're right, you're right. There's a reason why I'm doing this and reconnecting with that reason can change everything mm. um, about why I'm doing it. Yeah. Uh, Edie, what, Edie, what might you want to throw into this? You, you know, I. why do I think this, that somehow downgrid and ingrid people, just because maybe they're less expressive, I, I don't see them laugh as much, but that might not be because, I, what, what am I thinking? It just doesn't well, feel like. I think hmm. it goes back, it, it certainly is going to go back to this. If we go back to one of the first things we talked about laughter is that a great deal of the outwardly expression of laughter, there's a lot of people who are laughing their butts off and giving us no external manifestation right. of, that, of that. So, right. so that's where we go like, so I do believe there is a personality element to it. So certainly if even we look at the four main personalities, expressive, driver, analytical, amiable, we know which one is going to be most outward in their, in their display of laughter, right? Who's that going right. to be? Who is that? The driver. The driver. Uh -huh. mm, really? The driver, no, not huh? the expressive? The expressive. Oh, the expressive. The I'm expressive. just calling because I'm just going to go, they're the ones who want to express and laugh. Yeah. I, I believe... Uh -huh. Yeah, the driver is probably right there with them, maybe not quite as, but to me, the driver is the one that's belly laughing and, you know, they're the ones that are happy to make whatever the noise happens to be. Maybe it's a driver expressive, expressive driver kind of placement on that, but I think these are our people who are really out there laughing and laughing and laughing. So whether they're primary expressive, primary driver, I get, you know, that to me is where they are on the change grid. Um, mm -hmm. Where I go like an analytical, someone want to you know, demonstrate for us what the laughter of an analytical, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, it's going to be, I think, very quiet, very <laughs> subtle, very... <laughs> Almost like a smirk, would it be? Yeah, more of, of a smirk or whatever. Where in their head, they could be guffawing for all we know. Mm -hmm. you know? But mm -hmm. so I say that only to say I do believe that if we are defining laughter as an outward expression of an inward uh, process, then we might we're going to be missing a whole lot because the way an analytical or an amiable are going to outwardly display something does not necessarily tell the true story mm -hmm. of what's going on inside of them. I mean, amiables laugh to be polite. So mm -hmm. whatever it is, it's a very dignified kind of laughter, you know, uh, that sort of a, that sort of thing. I think it's also very cultural. So certain cultures, uh, look, Americans mm -hmm. are known all around the world as being loud. And, um, you know, Canadians are not too far behind. So stereotypes are stereotypes, but usually the patterns form because there's enough consistency in that pattern to go like, no, that's true. As I've gone to, I'm a quiet American, but when I've traveled, I noticed, boy, Americans really are loud. And so that means they're more, whatever, expressive drivers, driven expressives. Yeah. So mm -hmm. anyway, all that said, I think their personality parameters mm -hmm. and there are cultural parameters. There's also situational sorts of parameters. Mm -hmm. Back in the days when we could go and sit in a big audience at a theater and whatever the concert or the play hasn't started yet, you're just talking with your friends or you're at a movie, you're talking with your friends. We kind of know we're all supposed to be using our inside voices now. You know, we we all paid good money for this ticket. We need to be sensitive <laughs> to the people around us. And so, you know, that situation could also greatly impact how we choose to display whatever laughter experience we're having overall. You, you know what it reminds me of, you know, if you ever went 
like in New York City, you know, the bravo and the yelling and the screaming. And then you have the people that politely tap their right hand with their left. Exactly. You know what yes. I mean? The golf yeah. clap. The golf clap. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. No, this is true. So a lot of that outward expression, I do believe, is is uh, one say uh, impacted by fa by other factors. Mm -hmm. um, so so yeah. So there you go. So but but going back, we only have a few minutes to finish this, and then uh, mm -hmm. I think we've kind of talked enough about laughter. Um, but it's this idea about telling people that laughter therapy can be very useful to them. So. I think when we're talking to the person who is too far out grid, the heightened driver, we're just saying like, forget laughter, like belly laughing, but pause for a moment and enjoy the trip. Enjoy the life that you're on. Find something around that to, to have humor in or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. I believe that that these driven people are probably the most, the, the least likely, I was going to say the most likely to be non-compliant, non-participative in any mm -hmm. of these contrived kinds of therapies. Yeah. Right? You agree with that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Where I can see an expressive is all over it. You know? <laughs> hey, it's new, it's different. I'm all over it. The amiable will go through the motions to be polite. And the analytical is going to throw up evidence contrary to whatever it is you're saying or in support of whatever it is that you happen to be saying. So um, while it may be true that any of these laughter-based therapies can be effective, I would just wonder about that whole willingness part of the client to do whatever it is you're asking them to do. I think that's what happened to me, actually, because when my mentors would say that, yeah, there was some resistance there. And I didn't even know what the resistance was exactly. But it just seemed like, OK, I'm an achiever. I like doing things. And then one of them took me to a comedy club for the first time. And I became hooked on the whole arts and Broadways and funny Broadways and all that kind of stuff. I was just like hooked on it, literally. Like it was the, it was the best time ever for me. And so what's that actually telling us then is that not all uh, therapeutic uh, approaches are going to be appropriate for all clients. Mm -hmm. And what may work very effectively with one can work, can even be counter effective in another one. So we need to make sure that we're, we're very careful with this thought that laughter therapy is good for everybody. It may be true that laughing is good for everybody. Mm -hmm. So I might say, well, instead of me telling you to create a contrived laughter, why don't I instead ask the expressive, ask the driver, ask the client, what kinds of things do you find funny? What's your what's your natural you know source of, of humor? When was the last time you had a good belly laugh? What triggered that? And if they say, well, there's this comedian that I absolutely love. Well, then I want you to create a YouTube playlist of that comedian. <laughs> Next time you're feeling whatever, go watch your playlist uh, and do that. But this idea that trying to make everybody just laugh, um, I have I have questions about yeah. um, mm -hmm. how uh, realistic it is, how well it's going to be received. And, and part, of, part of me is also always worried. Okay, I'll just say this. You guys can let it fit wherever. I'm very worried when anyone in the human development industry becomes too connected to a particular therapeutic mm -hmm. approach or particular therapeutic mm -hmm. intervention, and they get mm -hmm. to be known mm -hmm. as that, and that can end up, while it might very much resonate with a certain population, it can also cost them reputation points among all the other populations. So as people in the human development industry, we want multiple arrows in our quiver, multiple tools in our toolbox, multiple um, uh, things that we might suggest based on our understanding of the client what they are most comfortable with, ready to do, et cetera. And, um, you know, kind of go from there. So you guys agree with me on that or? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then I would discourage you if you happen to stumble across the ad for becoming a certified laugh therapist. 
in, <laughs> in my, yeah, well, I'm just saying it's out there. It exists. Yeah. And um, I would say to you, it's really great if you say like, hey, I'll go learn about it because it could be useful under certain circumstances with certain clients, but I don't think I'm going to build a business around it. <laughs> yeah. Does that feel more, more realistic for us? Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. So uh, that's our time for today. I do want to uh, let everyone know that time changes this weekend. And so mm -hmm. starting next week, rather than our calls being at noon Eastern, they will be at one o'clock Eastern because time doesn't change in Arizona and I need to keep to the schedule that I've kind of built, which means for the first time ever, I'm asking everybody else to adjust to my time schedule instead of me adjusting to, oh, okay. <laughs> to everybody else's. So that's going to be adjusting a little bit. If it becomes a problem, then I'll see what I can do to, uh, to change my schedule. But right now I found I'm in such a good routine that I'm a little hesitant to disrupt that routine. So, so one Eastern. Okay. It'll, yeah, this call will be at one o'clock Eastern, but we're starting up a whole bunch more calls. They'll actually end up being a call every day uh, for a different part of the tiers of the membership. But for I think all of you guys that are on the call, um, you're open to come to all of those calls. So. Oh. Yeah. Nice. So when Could you start she send us something? On oh, you will. Yeah, I'll be Monday? sending out a full announcement. In fact, it's one of the oh. tests we have for the membership platform. Um, in fact, I got to check, make sure all you guys have, have been put into the membership platform because it'll automatically keep you updated. Uh, if you're if you're if you're part of in the member platform, but right now you guys are in a different database, and I have to make sure that we've imported that whole database into the um, into MemberPress. Um, so yeah. You'll be notified one way or another, hopefully automatically. If not, <laughs> the good old-fashioned manual way. I'll make sure you all know about it. Um, okay, so with that, thank you all very much for joining in. Uh, if you have any subjects you'd like us to explore next, uh, just let me know what it may be, and uh, I'll put that into the lineup. So thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye, for now. Uh -huh. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye. Have a good laugh. Bye. <laughs> Bye, everybody. You know what, T? Yep. Your joke about the blonde joke was hysterical. I'm glad I was on mute or I would have heard everybody's ears. <laughs> I, that is Isn't just... that good? What the blonde oh. said when she was pregnant, are you sure it's mine? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so funny. You go. My granddaughter is here and it's like, what's going on? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, have a good one. Okay, take care. Bye for now.